This is the Unsung Interview. Introducing the sports stars you don't know, telling the stories you can't miss. For over a century, the Tour de France has been a summer staple in the sporting calendar. Its lavender fields, epic mountain ranges and historic chateau have been the backdrop to some of cycling's most iconic and controversial moments. It's also the most photogenic event in sport. And so in this episode, I speak to a legend behind the lens, a man who spent decades looking over his left shoulder while perched precariously on the back of a fast-moving motorbike. Meters away from the likes of Eddie Merckx, Miguel Indurain, Laurent Fignon, and of course, Lance Armstrong. His name is Graham Watson, and he was the first English photographer to establish himself on the European cycling scene when he dared to muscle in on the tour in the late 70s. We discuss blurring the lines between photographer and fan, getting a sixth sense for when a crash is about to happen, and who was the nicest guy on tour. We also tackle the murkier topic of doping and how tainted champions have affected his business. But before we dance on the pedals, a little background. Born in London in 1956, Graham was, in his own words, useless at school and only got into photography at the behest of a desperate career advisor. Soon, he found himself working for an agency taking portraits of foreign royals. To save money, he'd cycled a 12-mile commute, sparking a love for a sport that would soon become the natural home for his new skills. Graham spoke to me from his home in Nelson, on New Zealand's beautiful South Island, where he's lived since his retirement in 2017, exactly 40 years after the Tour de France that would change his life forever. And that's where we'll pick up the conversation, at his very first tour in 1977. What prompted you to, to go to the tour that year then? Was it because of your increasing interest in, in cycling or by that point was there opportunities for photography? The main reason was I was really did keen on cycling and I thought I could be very good at it if I took the time to train and race and everything else. And the, the guy who was the legend of time then and who still is the greatest cycler there is Eddie Merckx. And of course, everybody wants to be the next Eddie Merckx. So I thought I'll, I'll go there and, I'll, and he, I knew the guy was riding his last tour in France in 1977, so I thought, oh, this is the one chance, I'm never going to have another chance. Go to Paris, watch the Tour de France, take a camera, and see if you can get a picture of Eddie Merckx. And that's exactly what I did. Um, it's, a, it's a very fairly familiar story in the cycling world, but uh, the picture won me a little prize in a magazine called Cycling Weekly, and um, that was the start of my, my, first, uh, my first ever trip to a bike race, and I, I earned, uh, I think, £25 from it which was quite a lot of money. It's probably £100 or so, £120 these days. And, and it suddenly clicked that ha, you can make money out of cycling photography as well as photographing royal, royalty and aristocracy. And once I'd been to Paris and seen it and just sampled the atmosphere and being in France for the first time was quite influential. And I thought, right, next year I'll come again. And, and then I started doing other races and just it just it snowballed. It just snowballed. You've carved out a, a very successful career off, off the back of that. I think it would be interesting to learn a bit more about the lifestyle and the business of being a, I presume you were a freelance photographer. How do you earn a full-time living from that? Uh, basically by going to as many races as you can in the knowledge that nobody else is doing it. And the more races you go to, the more images you take, the more you can sell to more magazines. It's, uh, it's like going to the sh- supermarket and buying the whole place and just reselling it to someone else. You know, I lived, if I earned £25 from that first ever picture, you know, I went back the year later to the Tour of France and probably earned uh, £200, which would be worth £800 these days. And I, I learned very quickly, from, literally from day one, that there was money to be had as long as I applied myself. There wasn't anyone else really in my way as far as an English-speaking person goes. My reputation was growing and growing and New magazines were starting up around the world because of English-speaking cyclists doing well against French cyclists and beating Italians and beating Germans and Belgians and Dutch. And, and magazines kind of started up because of that. And here I was running around Europe with my cameras. And I was the first person they came to because I spoke English and they spoke English. And the alternative was to go and buy pictures off an agency, but they'd be pretty average shots, uh, very, you know, like an, an agency photographer who goes to photograph a car crash one morning and then in the afternoon he's running off a bike race. I was kind of a specialist and I think that must have come out through some of my pictures when editors looked at it. They kind of knew what I was doing. I think in the beginning probably um, I was probably the equivalent of a 
a French photographer coming to England to, to photograph cricket. You know, it was, un, it was unheard of. <laughs> and especially as I, I kept coming back for more and more races, you know, lots of people do the tour, but not, not, not many people doing any, any other races at all. And here I was turning up every other weekend, taking pictures that no one else could get and, and selling them on. And, and, and in those early days, what were you doing for accommodation? We, I'm guessing you weren't treating yourself to five star luxury. In the very early days, I used to ride my bike around some of the sort of France. Sometimes I'd take a, a, an old Ford Escort with a bike in the back and I'd drive around France, you know, following the tour. If it was really busy, I'd park the car somewhere and ride my bike up the mountain to catch the race come by. Sometimes I actually rode around the tour on one occasion in 1983, just the bicycle. Although I took a train transfer from uh, the Alps to Paris on the, on the last day because that was too, that was just too far to ride. Yeah, I stayed in, uh, I took, took a tent with me, a little, little, uh, you know, ga- camping gas stove and very basic stuff and basic food. And then later years, of course, I got into the tour on a motorbike and all the other races as well. And, uh, you know, the, the bicycle went out, out of the, uh, out of the window. And, and then I, you know, proceeded to youth hostels. And then quite late, probably in the early nineties, I managed to find the money to stay in, you know, little one star, two star hotels everywhere. And then when you retired, had you graduated to something a little bit more luxurious? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I think it, I think the business grew and grew until by the mid nineties, I I knew what a good hotel was, and I knew what a decent meal was, and probably also knew what a decent bottle of wine was. But um, it hadn't been like it wasn't like that in the beginning. Yeah, I had some pretty good clients and people like Greg LeMond, won the tour. He's an American guy, and that opened up a whole commercial world I never knew existed. Yeah, roll on five, eight, ten years later and Lance Armstrong comes along. And again, you know, despite what happens in hindsight, I mean, he he opened up a whole new market for people like me. For anyone sort of unfamiliar with how a, a cycling photographer positions themselves on the motorbike, could you maybe describe the art of riding pillion whilst, you know, staying safe, taking pictures, staying out, the, out of the way of the race... I mean, there's quite a lot of things to consider. Yeah, I mean, I did it for so many years that I never, I never thought about it. But obviously, if someone said to me next week, we're going to put you on a motorbike in the Tour de France for a day, I would probably just have a heart attack and drop dead. I'd be so scared. But really, it's, it's a, a motorbike is no, it's no more dangerous than a, an armchair you're sitting in. Um, they're big, heavy things. Uh, they probably weigh three quarters of a ton, and they're not going to move very far, even, even with a big guy like me on the back. But basically, you just sit there. You make sure your feet are firmly on the on the pedals, so you don't rock the motorbike. You tend to use your. You don't put your hands on the little grips behind you. You tend to be just independent of the motorbike, sitting there using your stomach to stop you going forward into the driver's back, and using your thighs, the tops of your thighs, to make sure you don't go back the other way. And it's actually it actually becomes quite a good workout. But it's it's there's not much to it. You just don't 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 make sudden movements. As a photographer, you have to, you do most of your work pointing with the camera back over your, your left shoulder. And lots of photographers, yeah, probably once a year they have back trouble because they're, they've been twisting around for literally for hours on end each day. And then at some stage, the body says enough is enough. But it's not really dangerous. It does scare people. But, and occasionally you do have a crash or you see a crash. So it does happen. I'd rather be on a motorbike than on a bicycle. <laughs> About a year and a half ago now, I spoke to Luke Evans, who was your motor pilot for a little while, said a, a lot of nice things about you. Yeah. He'd be happy to hear. He mentioned that he'd moved on to, to Le Keep after you retired, but he also said that the 2018 Tour de France, he forgot his photographer at one point. He literally stopped at a hairpin bend, photographer got off, and then they all, they all sort of raced off and he realised a little bit down the road that he'd, he'd forgotten his photographer. So I, I wanted to ask if he'd ever, he'd ever forgotten you. No. No, I think you're under, you're under, as a driver, you're under an awful lot of pressure in the Tour de France because there's so much going on around you. Driving a French patrol from Le Keep, they, they are under huge pressure as well to get the best pictures. And so it puts pressure on someone like Luke Evans driving and he's, he's basically had a, a brain fade, you know, one, one moment. And, and it actually was with a photographer who was renowned for being uh, temperamental. And so actually, the little I heard, because don't forget I was living in New Zealand by then, but the way I heard it was that uh, the photographer wasn't happy at all, but 
all the other photographers on the tour, and especially the colleagues of the Spanish photographer, came up and you know patted Luke on the back, and they said, "Well, well done. We love that." Because <laughs> you just you don't leave your, your photographer behind. I mean, he's part of your life for three weeks. I mean, that leads us on to a really quite a unique part of your job in in sports photography. Really, is that you're not just well, you're not an observer. Really, you're actually part of the race. A footballer or a rugby photographer takes a position in the stadium, and then that's it. But whereas you're 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 physically moving throughout the whole day with hundred other maniacs on bikes trying to to go as fast as they can, you know it must be quite a, a, a difficult proposition to juggle, really. Yeah, I mean, it, it, with me, it came through practice and experience. So by the time I got into the Tour de France in 1987 on a motorbike, uh, exactly ten years after. I'd first ever seen the tour in Paris on a bicycle. Yeah, I'd, I'd done all, basically done all the other races on on a motorbike before I got into the tour in '87. So I was already quite experienced. And one of your major roles is to make sure you take care of your driver because he his, he or she is the one that, who's at the sharp end of driving you through all this madness, all these bicycles and cars and other motorbikes. So that's your first responsibility. In other words, then neither of you get into trouble. And then you're, you know, you're surrounded by probably up to 200 cyclists sometimes. In a typical day, you'll drive that motorbike past what they call the peloton probably five or six times you know, a day, which is quite stressful for the driver. It can be stressful for the driver, but it's actually quite good fun because you, you really are in the thick of the peloton. And you, and you, if they are able to talk, you hear what they're saying. Um, if they're not able to talk, then you just watch them sweating and perspiring and usually having a pretty horrible time. Um, but you're also there when they're in good form, when they're flying down the road, you know, leading the tour of arts to the yellow jersey. You, you, you're so close up, you, you feel all their emotions and all their and all their pressures and stress and everything else. It's impossible to explain to someone who's not done it what, what it's like, and I, I can't explain properly. It's, um, it's just a very special place to be. You've got to want to be in it, in, in, amongst, in amongst all that. The one of the overriding emotions of the whole. The whole forty years is, is the is the privilege you, I had being in the Tour de France on a motorbike. This one solitary Englishman amongst all the uh, you know the Dutch and Belgians and French and Italians and Spanish. It's uh, and you and you you know you're competing with the biggest agencies in the world. So uh, it's quite a thrill. What was your relationship like with the the cyclists in general? I mean, were they were they happy to see you? Did, did they tend to um, smile? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can't promise you they smiled all day long in the tour, but they uh, again the, the the tour to us that know it is just one race amongst many many hundreds of others each year. It has all the glamour that comes with it and all the fame and history and nostalgia and everything else. But I, I was photographing all the other cyclists, you know, for, for the rest of the season as well. So from mid January right through to uh, to the middle of July and afterwards. And so basically, you know, with very few exceptions, if any, I mean, I had a very good relationship with all of them. Even I couldn't speak their language, especially with social media now. They they can see where your pictures are instantly. You know, they they they've had their massage, they've maybe had dinner, and they've got an hour before they fall asleep, and they go online and look at websites and the team website or the Tour de France website, and and they can see which pictures I took. So you have quite a a, a rapt audience, if you like. I mean, they're they're there, they're there to perform, and they know what they're doing, and the relationship was was always very very good. And obviously, you're a big cycling fan as well. Did you ever find yourself, even subconsciously, rooting for some, blurring that line between fan and, and professional? I, th- I think I did. And I would say I did that until, I'm thinking like the mid-1990s. You know, I mean, I I know Sean Kelly, and when we talk, you know, whenever we see each other, we, we talk as, as, as you yeah, know, two equals. But uh, when I first got into the sport, he was the cyclist that I looked up to the most. Uh, and maybe a guy called Phil Anderson from Australia. They were gods. They were gods. You know, they were. My my ambitions as, as a cyclist ended very quickly, which is one of the most important things that ever happened to me. But I was ending up photographing these these legends, these these uh, monster champions. And so I suppose I, over the years that Kelly raced, which is a long time, you know, I always wanted him to win. You know, always, always, always. But by the time I'd gone past that point and started working for Spanish companies and Japanese and Americans and that. I didn't really let myself get too involved emotionally. I mean, I just really enjoyed what I was photographing. And whoever won, won, I didn't mind whether it was a, 
you know, a Frenchman or a Dutchman or an Italian or a Slovenian or something. It didn't bother me at all. I just didn't, I was, by that time, I was probably, you know, more concerned with getting the right amount of pictures for my clients, which in turn would make sure I get paid at the end of the month. Uh, but, but obviously, you'd, you'd had that all like, experience cycling yourself. Did you find yourself preempting instances where you thought this is going to be an opportunity, whether that's an attack or, or a crash? Or did you get a sense, a, a crackle in the atmosphere that something was about to happen? Uh, yeah, I think, I think physical things like watching a road suddenly go uphill without any warning. Each race has a kind of a, a road book, which is not always a book now, it's an online manual, but it means everybody who's accredited to the race get access to this information and you follow the most important thing, which is the profile of a stage or a race. And you look at that and some of these climbs are categorised, so they have a clip, so there's obvious, you know, somebody might attack there, somebody might get dropped out the back of the peloton. But there's an awful lot of road where it's not classified. It's not classified in the book. But you're going along thinking, well, you know, they've done 100 miles. Uh, they must be getting a little bit tired. And there's this hill coming up, which isn't in the book. So your experience as a cyclist says, ah, I'm going to stop here. I'm not going to do what's obvious. I'm going to stop here and, and see what happens. And uh, similarly, you come across a bad section of road and your experience says to you, someone's going to fall off here. So many things like this every day, you use your experience as, as a cyclist, but also now as a cycling photographer. You know, you know what these guys can do and what they can't, and, and you anticipate what might happen. It doesn't always happen, but you an, at least anticipate it, and it gives you a huge advantage over a photographer who, as I said earlier, does a, works for an agency photographing politics or fashion, and he's, told, he's been told to do the Tour de France, and you won't get the best out of him or her. It's always the specialists who... It can't be the best pictures. You've witnessed a, a crash. You go to take the picture. What's the kind of etiquette on that? Is you know obviously there the could be a cyclist in an incredible amount of pain, dislocated something. Do you have to just you know take yourself away from the emotion of it and and, and snap away? Um, yes, the answer to all that is yes. I went through a phase when I, when I first got into cycling photography, and I felt like I'd arrived. I'd stop being a cyclist, literally. It's funny, it's funny. I'd stop being a cyclist because it's too time-consuming. But I had taken up running. And I noticed that when there are crashes, and there's a crash every day in every race you go to, I wasn't bothered by taking a picture of a, of a cyclist covered in blood or screaming out in agony or whatever. I didn't like it, but I wasn't bothered by it. I was detached. And then about 10, 15 years later, back in 2001, I... I took up cycling again because I was having bad knees from running and carrying too much weight while I was running. And as soon as I took up cycling and then went back into a race to photograph the race, I, I, I looked the other way. Whenever there was a crash, I'd, I'd almost look away because I, it was that, I was that much closer to it you know, emotionally. And, and that kind of stayed with me for the last you know, 20 years of my career or 16 years of my career, uh, being much more discreet because I know what, how, how it hurts when you fall. I've, I've fallen. And I wouldn't want my picture being taken. The professional cyclists, 99.9 of them, uh, know what you're doing. As long as you're doing it very quickly, they 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 won't say anything. If if they're on the ground for 20 seconds, and you're you're standing there for five seconds, that's fine. If they're on the ground for two for two or three minutes with something more serious, and you're still standing there taking pictures, then they'll they'll probably say something. You've got to always think of tomorrow when you're going to see them in in the same race or. In a month's time in another race, you'd, you've got to be friends with them and respect what they do. Back to my conversation with Graham in a bit, where he shares his views on cycling's murky history and why you should never take a photo of a cyclist looking like a rotisserie chicken. But first, a word about our unsung charity partner. Leading social care charity Community Integrated Care deliver 10 million hours of care annually to people with learning disabilities, autism, mental health concerns, dementia and complex care needs. Their revolutionary inclusive volunteering model sees a partner with sporting events like the Rugby League World Cup and UEFA Women's Euro, enabling thousands with complex barriers to enjoy sport. To find out how you can work with the charity or access their support, visit communityintegratedcare.co.uk. Now, back to the interview, where Graham's about to tell us what Lance Armstrong told him over a coffee. Have you had cyclists in the past who, who were unhappy with, with a picture you'd taken? Not so much the picture, but the fact I was taking a picture. I think most of these guys, I mean, they're hard, they're hard people. They've been junior cyclists, they've been amateurs, and now they're professional. And uh, you, have, you have situations where 
a lot of them, uh, a guy like David Miller, um, Lance Armstrong, the subject always comes up if you're having a coffee, like, because uh, I know I'm going to photograph them on the floor one day. And they both said, Graham, get the best shots you can, as much blood as we can see. <laughs> and then you have, li literally. And then you have another example where, I think there was a French cyclist who fell off for you know, uh, a little Swiss race once, uh, Tour of Romandy. And he was a nice French guy, he knew me, knew who I was sending my pictures to. And he just fell off, he just slipped. He, and it was no big deal, but spontaneously I took a picture and then moved off because it wasn't spectacular, it wasn't, it didn't need a second picture. And you know, 20 seconds later, he came by on the motorbike and he said, bonjour, and I said, bonjour. And I asked him, are you okay? He said, yeah, I'm fine. He said, he said please don't send those pictures to anybody. And I said, okay, I won't. Because if they say that, I, I don't send the pictures out. Sure. And I said, I sort of said politely, why? And he said, well, it was a very stupid crash. I don't want people to see me falling like that. And B, I don't want my family to see pictures like that. So I, I basically just destroyed the images and, he, and they, ne they were never seen. So there's this kind of, um, if you want to call it etiquette or whatever, but you, you, you work with them. As you say, it's a long-term thing, isn't it? You've got to have a long-term relationships with these people. And, mm. you know, that, that element of mutual respect must be key and integral to, to having a career as long as, as you had. Did you have any a particular sort of favourite stage or lo location that was, you know, particularly picturesque or, or great for photographs? Over the years, I've, you know, I've gone to all the, you know, the best parts of France to see the tour go by. And uh, I wouldn't say I've got a favourite place. All the photographers always look for a sunflower shot. Um, you know those come usually in the southwest of France. If you want shots of castles and chateaus, you go, you wait for the Tour de France to go through the Loire Valley, Lavender in Provence or Drome. You know exactly where everything's going to be. It's just a question of whether the tour is going there on that day. One of my wishes with my work was every day to yeah, get the hard action shots when someone wins or attacks or falls off or has a bicycle change or something. But you had to recall the, the beautiful scenery you were going through because that's so much of the Tour de France. Yeah, the, the chateaus, the... I mean, France has a 5,500-kilometre coastline, and that's a lot of beaches <laughs> and a lot of sea views to be recorded on camera. And I always try to show the character of the, of the, the stage, in, as far as, not as far as action goes, but as just purely where we were, this is what it was like, this is what I saw. And that way you get a very, a very nice image of France over three weeks. And and what about favourite Tour de France riders to to take pictures of? That's quite an easy one because they, the the good the good looking guys tend to win the races and they they look very regal and um, I would say people like Laurent Fignon back in the day, Miguel Indurain, both winners of the Tour de France. Who else would I say? And I, I liked Albert Contador. He was quite quite a you know a photogenic guy and lots of different emotions when you're photographing him. And he won a lot, he lost a lot. Uh, always looking for him in the cameras. Um, probably my outright favourite, I would say, is, is Miguel, Miguel Indurain, the Spanish guy. He won the tour for five years in the, in the mid-90s. Probably in old money, six foot two. So very statuesque from uh, near Pamplona. So very brown and bronzed. Extremely lean. And he's, physically, he was incredible. And the nice thing was that he was an absolute, absolute gentleman. You know, and uh, he had time for everybody. Uh, not so much during the tours he won, but he, he if you he, if he met him after the tour, I mean, he would, you know, kind of put his hand on his shoulder and say hi. And it's a real gentleman, you know. Um, and there are some there are some very nice guys out there, but he was uh, beyond that. So you mentioned the Tour de France. You know, can't go without mentioning the, you know, the shadow of, of, of doping, particularly the, the Lance Armstrong years, but also there was the, the Festina affair in, in, in 98. The subject's been covered many times before, and it's not necessarily that, you know, I want to go into it too deeply lest we get sidetracked. But what I'm interested in is more from the angle of those who cover it and who covered it in those years, in terms of yourself as a photographer and, and the journalists who covered it. How, how do you look back now at the, the work you did through those, those years? Uh, the work I did, I was totally happy with it. I'm um, uh, not just Lance, but... Uh, several other people, like you said, Festina and even people before Festina. Sometimes you can wear two or three hats and most of the time I was wearing my hat as a photographer and you, you have no other thoughts as to what might or might not be going on. I mean, in hindsight, we've all been proved quite wrong, but you know, you, you, you want the best picture of that person on that day. By and large, you know, it's the, it's the winners that get caught. 
the way I've dealt with it over the years, because there have been so many occasions when, you know, psychics I've photographed and perhaps, in, you know, cheered a little bit publicly have come up as, as, if you like, if you want to call the word cheats, call them cheats. And I just think, oh, so what? I mean, it's not my business to say what they should and shouldn't do. It's their job. And they probably had to do what they did. And I just try and, you know, remember what that, what, if Lance won a stage of the Tour de France in 2004, or uh, Alex Zul or Richard Varenk won a stage of a Tour de France for Festina, and you got some great pictures. And it was, and it meant them winning those stages meant so much to so many millions of people around the world that just freeze it in time, enjoy it for what it was. People loved it. I loved it. And, and just leave them be, move on. I'm, I'm, I'm probably a bit rare in the sense, you know, most people say, no, lock them up. Send them to the Tower of London. They cheat, they cheat, but we all cheat. We all cheat. And that's, that's how I've dealt with it over the years, is to, if there ever was disappointment, if you ever thought the world was going to end because, you know, Marco Pantani had been pushed out of a, the Tour of Italy for some doping infraction, you recover very quickly because, you know, you get selfish, you've, you've, you've built your business, I built my business, and I wasn't going to let any of these guys ruin it for me. So I found, found a way of enjoying it, of getting over the, the shock, if you like, and any, any disappointment, and just moving on. And psych is also a sport which is very beautiful. Um, I don't just mean the scenery, I mean the actual, the beauty of riding a bicycle. It is, is quite a, for somebody, it's a very beautiful thing. And there's so many uh, positive things about um, cycling. They, they overcome the negatives. Well, they, at least they have for me. You mentioned the, the, the business side of it there. The journalists who may have written gushingly about, say, Armstrong years ago, they might look back at some of their work and they might feel a little bit, you know, awkward or, or even embarrassed maybe. But it's not necessarily going to affect their bottom line. You know, nobody's reading their work from 10, 15, 20 years ago. Whereas a photographer like yourself, you know, I've, I've looked at your website, it's got hundreds, thousands of amazing imagery that I'm assuming still gets bought to this day. Are people still buying Lance Armstrong images, for example? Has that affected the income? Um, y- y- yes and yes. Um, first of all, Lance, Lance retired in 2005. And by that time, I, I without getting involved in money, I, I couldn't have made more money out of him. It, it could never have been planned. And so when he retired, the, 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 the interest in his imagery lingered a bit. He came back, but he came back during a time when he had a lot of accusers, you know, pointing their fingers at him. And noticeably, a lot of people still bought pictures of him, far, far less, because they, they'd done their time. And also, if you were a fan of Lance Armstrong in the early 2000s, then you, you five years later, you probably moved on a bit. And so to answer your question is, um, yeah, I hardly sell any pictures of him now. It's... Um, Cycling is a funny thing. I think it's like it recycles itself. It's constantly churning out new cyclists. The old ones are never forgotten, and especially not Lance. But uh, there's always someone new coming along, and it just refreshes the the peloton. It refreshes the people, the things I would photograph. It refreshes the stories that get written by journalists. And over time, over time, over time, they're never forgotten, but they're not not relevant to today's you know, coverage of cycling. Obviously, you must get asked all the time what your favourite photos are. So I want to take a slightly different approach and I want to ask you what photos that are seem to be everybody else's favourites, That do you have any that you really aren't a massive fan of? The ones that um, people keep by... Actually, you're not even going to answer this question, are you? Because it wouldn't make any business sense, would it? <laughs> oh, yeah, I've, I've got an answer building. Oh, go head. on then. Um, to be honest, when I... What, the way I ran my business all these years, I, I, I was my own boss. I never had one particular client who had my exclusive attention. And also, because, I was, I'd, because I'd done it for so long, people trusted me to get the pictures and enabled me to basically send them only the pictures I wanted them to see, uh, rather than uploading everything, um, which we might do these days. But, you know, in, for most of my career, I chose carefully the pictures I would send to my editor, whether it be um, online through a digital system or physically slides or even prints. So that way I never saw a picture printed of mine that I was disappointed with. That's the simplest way of answering it. Whereas a newspaper photographer or an agency photographer, they're expected to upload their entire 
working days images to the company and, and they lose all control of what gets printed and what gets left out. So I was kind of my, own, my I was like a judge and a jury at the same time, making sure that, that if there was anything doubtful, I didn't send it. Right. Um, sometimes there's little things as a cyclist told you, when a cyclist comes around the corner and you're taking a picture on the inside, for example, so he's leaning into the corner and coming past you, it's kind of side on, but he's, the leg nearest the camera is, it's not in the driving position, it's kind of half bent backwards, so you just throw it away. Because you don't, you don't, right. you don't. I don't want my name on a picture whereby the cyclist looks like a, you know, a, a rotating a rotisserie chicken or something. You know, <laughs> cyclists look elegant when they're the driving leg, if you like, is either about to drive down or when it is when it is right down, it's full a full stretch. They don't look good when they're when their driving leg, what should be their driving leg, is is all twisted up, you know, towards their backsides. So things like that, you throw them away. I'm so always surprised when I look at these these photographers these days that the people don't always do that. It's got to make a cyclist look like he's uh, some sort of god. Well, that adds further insight into why you had such a good relationship with the cyclists as well. And I imagine if you were if you were that sort of militant in the editing process that you know that if that's your end goal, then uh, no wonder you were no wonder you were popular with them. <laughs> yeah, and then also I, I uh, yeah, there are times when I told, said earlier when I better crash. There are crashes which are too nasty for anyone to see. And whereas an agency photographer would seize that as an absolute golden nugget, if you like, and send the picture in, I would think, no, nah, no, nah, it's too bad. And similar, sim a few other similar things. Sometimes cyclists are fighting. You know, you see a fight sometimes. And the, the, the trick is not to take a picture. <laughs> so sometimes I would literally do that. I'd see a couple of guys fighting in, on the last stage of a tour de France when they've lost their temper, you know, they're tired and all that, and they're fighting. And you just look away. Others will take a picture. And you can get people disqualified. You know, you, if you've got proof that someone was having a fight, they're, they're out on the tour, you know. You, so you, so you, can do, you can do things like this. And if there's one, if there's one example I can tell you of when it didn't work out, it was uh, in the Tour of Italy in 2015. And there was a cyclist from Team Sky, Richie Port. There was a, a friend of his, another Australian called Simon Clark from Greenwich. And we're driving along behind the peloton. Port was going for the win that year. And at the time of the, he had a flat tyre. The team car wasn't anywhere near. And my driver spotted this, I didn't. And he tapped me on my leg. And all I could see was Richie Port pulling inside the side of the road, Simon Clark making a beeline for him. And uh, it's almost as if they'd taken their course in, in mechanics because both riders got their front wheel out straight away. And Simon Clark actually got off his bike, ran over to Richie Port, put the front wheel in, his front wheel in Richie Port's bike, did the skewer up, and then pushed him off down the road. And I'm taking pictures. And I'm thinking, this is incredible. Uh, I, I got a scoop, and it was a scoop I, I could send to people because there was, there was nothing wrong with it. So I did. So I sent the pictures in. I was very pleased with myself. I was the only one that, that was there. And then uh, a few hours later, and I also I posted on Twitter saying, you know, this particular. And then Richie Port retweeted it, saying, thanks, Simon Clark, for helping me out. Really appreciate it. Well, <laughs> well I'm still in the press room, working away on the other images, and the journalist comes over and he said, um, he said, there's a bit of shit going down. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you took that picture of Richie Port and Simon Clark. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, they're going to find them 10 minutes and 500 Swiss francs. And I said, well, what for? And he said, well, it's against the rules. Not to take the picture. Because, well, because they were on different teams? On different teams, yeah, even though they're friends. And uh, <laughs> so I thought, oh, I've taken this picture, sent it out. Richie Port retweeted it and I've got them all into trouble. And that was a time when, if I'd known better, I would have, I would not have sent the pictures in. Well, in in fairness, R Richie Port mustn't have mustn't have known that rule either. If he's retweeting it, he didn't. It's not a rule you'd think about because it's, it's it never happens because the team Sky Car should have been there. It didn't require someone from Green Edge to uh, sacrifice his chances for a rival. But it was funny because it, it um, obviously I spoke to them. Uh, and I said, I'm really sorry about that. They said, no, Graham, it's not your problem. It's, it was Rich's problem for retweeting it. And uh, anyway, we're still friends, so. Oh, good, good. And are you still, I know you're on the other side of the world now, but are you still engrossed in, in the sport? Are you, have you been watching the, the Giro? Will you, be, will you be tuning in to the Tour de France? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love it when there's a, I watch most of the major races down here via 
you know, Sky TV or you know, uh, live streaming or whatever. You, there's always a way of finding almost everything. And uh, I, I really get into the uh, three-week races. I love it. You know, you get up in the morning and you're, you know, 11 hours ahead of the rest of the world and you have your breakfast and you don't read cycling news at all. And as soon as you've had your breakfast, um, you go and watch the, the stage that's coming through the night. It's great. It's, uh, I'm, I'm very much into it as a, uh, as a fan. You know, not as a, not as a photographer, obviously, but uh, it's a, a very different way of seeing it. You know, does it spark pangs of nostalgia? Do you do you miss it, or are you, are you watching? You think, you know, I'm I'm glad I'm not there. Uh, both. I mean, I I the only thing I miss is the lifestyle. It's a challenge of things like trying to find your hotel and getting to the restaurant before it closes at nine o'clock, and and turning up at a restaurant in France at two minutes to nine to be told uh, to you know, we're closed. And, and there's all this stuff and, you know, running for a flight or jumping on a train or all, all these things, logis- logistical challenges. And collectively, I call it like an, uh, a rom- romance of travel. And and that's the only thing I miss because because I see cycling on TV. Um, you know, I, I still watch, what, watch my, what my colleagues are photographing. I see their work, which, which keeps me entertained. Um, but the only thing I actually miss is that, that rather unique lifestyle. There will be even people looking at your photos and who might want to follow in your footsteps. How would you, bear in mind the <laughs> the environment has changed quite dramatically since when you first took your you know first steps into cycling photography. But how, how would you? Um, what advice would you give them these days? Well, the, 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 the advice I'd give is to give it a shot. Literally, give it your best. Go there with your mind wide open. When I say go there, I mean go to mainland Europe. You know, go there with your mind wide open and treat it as a, as a lifestyle choice as well as a, a possible business venture and give everything you've got to it for as long as you can and, and you won't be sorry you'll come away with uh, lots of memories, you, you'll, meet, you'll have met some great people, you've had a bit of heartache now and again, a few setbacks but um, it's, it's, a, it's great if, you were to be, if I was going to be a photographer now, uh, I, would, I would try and be a cycling photographer because of the, the lifestyle that comes with it you know, you're not locked up in a football stadium or the studio anywhere you're out there seeing life in a, in a way that very few people do don't go in there just thinking you're going to be a photographer and you're going to conquer the world and be famous just just go there and enjoy yourself and and you know to see what you see what you come out with in terms of access is it harder now than it was to get to get involved to be a freelancer um in some ways it's easier because say there's a hundred people like me who've done it and kind of paved the way for, if I can use the word foreigners, to get involved in what is still a very European-based sport. You know, there's no no longer kind of restrictions as if you're English, so I'm sorry, you can't come. If you're American, no, we don't want you. Those doors have been knocked down forever. And um, you've got a golden opportunity. It's just it's just that there's a, because of the internet, because of social media, there's a, an awful lot more people doing it, which is good for the sport. It means there's more people photographing it. And it's not quite so easy to break into it, but... Uh, just recently, I had a New Zealand photographer came to see me in Nelson, a young guy, probably mid twenties, and uh, he'd done cycling photography in New Zealand. And he he took me out for a beer, you know. I told him exactly what to expect and everything else, and I actually pointed him in the right direction with a few people who would help him. And his, his stuff is on on some of the Tour of Italy websites now. He's he's gone there. He went he went there last year, and he obviously liked it enough. He went back this year. Which for a kid from New Zealand is quite a huge step because you're literally on the other side of the world, and uh, he's there now. And yeah, I see his stuff every day on on his Instagram page, and he's loving it. Oh, good on him! Yeah, I, d- I don't know if he's making money, but he's um, he's making a little name for himself. Yeah, well, he can't have um, he can't have asked for better in terms of you know a mentor in terms of getting some advice from someone who's been there and done it all. I'll do I'll do many things for a beer. You can view thousands of Graham's photos from the Tour de France and pretty much every other event in cycling over on his website, grahamwatson.com. There's a link in the show notes, along with a link to Graham's tweet featuring the picture of Richie Port and Simon Clark that got both in trouble at the Giro d'Italia. If you know of anyone with a unique perspective from behind the scenes of elite sport, get in touch with a recommendation for a future Unsung interview or story. Just head to unsungpodcast.com where you can suggest a guest. My thanks again to Graham Watson for speaking to me for this podcast, which was produced by Matt Cheney. 
artwork is by Matt Walker and the executive producer is Sam Barry. My name is Alexis James. Thanks for listening and catch you next time on Unsung. Unsung.